Hi, it's Katrina. Muslim Cemetery in Spain The early Middle Ages was a troubling time, marked by a series of religious wars known as the Crusades. During that period, Spain was a major frontier between warring Muslims and Christians. Recently, archaeologists have uncovered hundreds of graves in a Spanish town, revealing secret Muslim history in the region that had been wiped away from all historical records. Muslim rulers conquered the region in the early 8th century. Their victory can be partially attributed to their generous surrender terms, which were much more appealing to the populace than the harsh conditions that they had endured throughout the wars and under previous rule. In 756 AD, a Muslim ruler was able to unify the various Islamic groups that had conquered Spain, greatly expanding and strengthening their power. Over the next several hundred years, the region became home to one of history's greatest Islamic civilizations. Much of the Iberian Peninsula's rich Muslim history was forgotten after the Catholic king and queen Ferdinand and Isabella took over and made it their mission to reconquer Spain and expel or destroy anyone who was not part of the Catholic faith. In late 2020, archaeologists discovered an Islamic cemetery in the Spanish town of Tauste. The site consisted of 433 graves, dating between the 8th and 12th centuries, with the deceased having been laid to rest according to traditional Muslim burial customs. This cemetery was in continuous use for over 400 years. The archaeologists said they thought it was a cemetery, but what they found was quite unexpected. The latest discoveries show the extent of Muslim influence, even though much of it has been erased. Mysterious Odyssey Notes Written by the Greek author and poet Homer during the 8th or 7th century BC, the Odyssey is one of the most famous epic poems of the ancient world. It's also one of the oldest literary works that's been enjoyed throughout history and is still printed and read today. In 2007, a book collector named M. C. Lang donated some of his copies of Homer's works to the University of Chicago Library. He pointed out some bizarre notes written in the page margins inside an edition of the Odyssey from 1504. He said he was willing to pay a $1,000 reward to anyone who could decipher them. The library's Special Collections Research Center published the offer in hopes that someone would be able to help. Lang believed that the notes, which only appear in one section of the book, were written during the mid-19th century and suspected that the script was a form of shorthand but had no other leads on their origin. And, as it turned out, he was right. Submissions poured in from around the world. The winning prize went to experts Daniel Matili and Julia Acheta, who determined that the writing was, in fact, a form of French shorthand that was invented by someone named Jean Coulon de Thévenot during the late 18th century. They also found that the actual content of the notes wasn't as exciting as you might think. Most of them were simply French translations of the Greek text that the book was printed in. Metili and Acheta said that they planned to continue translating the notes in hopes of figuring out who wrote them and why they are only present in one part of the book. Florida's Earliest Settlers Until somewhat recently, most experts believed that the first people to step foot in the Americas were a group called the Clovis people, who arrived around 13,000 years ago. But a growing body of evidence is proving that there were earlier civilizations who made their way here thousands of years before the Clovis people. One discovery that's helping to rewrite the history of human movement was made in northern Florida in 2016 at a sinkhole called the Page Ladson site. Archaeologists had long known about the sinkhole, which sits at the bottom of the Osceola River south of Tallahassee. But it is really difficult to explore because sinkholes are usually dark and murky. They are layers of black water that is like trying to dive in iced tea. Florida State University professor Jesse Halligan decided not to shy away from the task. She led a study that meticulously analyzed the river's sediment layers, which turned up an ancient knife and several other handcrafted stone objects, as well as prehistoric camelid, bison, and mastodon bones. The team dated the artifacts to be around 14,550 years old showing that a group of humans reached Florida before the Clovis people arrived in North America. This mysterious population lived at the tail end of the last ice age, when sea levels were 300 feet lower than they are today. At the time, the Osceola River didn't yet exist, 
The sinkhole was instead located at the bottom of a pond that served as a freshwater source for animals and people. In addition to helping scholars sort out the timeline of prehistoric human migration throughout the Americas, discoveries like this offer insight into how these enigmatic populations survived and their relationship with their surroundings. Lost Army of Cambyses The ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote about the tale of the lost army of Cambyses in the Histories, a lengthy record of his observations and things he learned during his travels. According to the story, a ruler named Cambyses II rose to power as the ruler of the Persian Achaemenid Empire during the 6th century BC. In 524 BC, he sent 50,000 soldiers from Thebes to Egypt to deal with a group of rebellious priests who refused to acknowledge his leadership. They all mysteriously vanished during the arduous march through the Sahara. Herodotus wrote that a brutal sandstorm swept through the region a week into the journey and buried the men. Their remains were nowhere to be found. Some modern-day experts concluded that the story is probably mythical. Others remained open to the idea that it could be true. Over the years, archaeologists have undertaken numerous expeditions to try to find the lost army of Cambyses, but time and time again, these searches failed to pan out. In 2009, Italian researchers announced that they had finally found the remains of the soldiers who went missing 2,500 years ago. After searching for 13 years, the team had unearthed bronze weapons, a silver bracelet, an earring, and hundreds of human bones in the remote wilderness of the Sahara. The artifacts appear to be from the Achaemenid dynasty, lending weight to the possibility that the human remains belong to members of Cambyses' missing army. But not everyone is convinced. For one, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities hadn't approved of the search. Secondly, the findings were never presented in an academic journal, which would have opened information up to peer review. Instead, the discoveries appeared in a documentary. At the same time, nobody has managed to rule out the possibility that Cambyses' soldiers perished at the site. Christianity in Denmark A 10th century carving known as the Gelling Stone puts Christianity's arrival in Denmark at around 965 AD. It was commissioned by Harold Bluetooth, a notorious king who is credited with converting the Danes to Christianity after conquering Norway and Denmark. The modern symbol of Bluetooth today is in his honor. But a discovery that was made in 2016 is challenging this narrative. While exploring the Danish island of Funen with his metal detector, Amateur archaeologist Dennis Fabricius Holm found a necklace resembling a crucifix. He posted photos of the artifact on social media and soon realized that it was a bigger deal than he originally thought. Experts caught wind of Holm's discovery and decided to take a look at the necklace. Archaeologist Moline Beck told national broadcasting station DR that the artifact, known as the Anslev Crucifix, could prove to be a game-changer in our understanding of Christianity's history in the region. Describing it as a sensational find, she explained that the necklace dates back to the first half of the 10th century. A similar piece from the same time period had also recently been found in Denmark, further pointing toward the likelihood that Christianity was introduced decades before the gelling stone was created. In Beck's words, the person who wore the crucifix would undoubtedly have adhered to the Christian faith. Artifacts like this remind us that historical narratives are not set in stone, and that just one new discovery can dramatically change our understanding of the past. The Basham Head In the early 19th century, someone discovered a large stone head in the English coastal town of Basham in West Sussex. Made from Italian marble, it's roughly twice the size of an average person's head and weighs 375 pounds. The sculpture was in bad condition, making it impossible to identify who it might represent before modern technology came along. Researchers finally put the mystery to rest in 2013, after 200 years of wondering and guessing. Using 3D laser scanners, a team of experts were finally able to distinguish the head's facial features and hairstyle. They concluded with reasonable certainty that the head depicts Roman Emperor Trajan. Archaeologist Dr. Miles Russell, who participated in the study, believes that Trajan's successor Hadrian, commissioned the statue's placement during a visit to Britain in 121 or 122 AD. Russell described the discovery as one of the most important finds from Roman Britain. He also said that it's a shame that the statue was ignored and overlooked for so long, 
before experts were finally able to put a name to the face. Sealed 17th century letters. During the late 17th century, Simon de Brin and his wife Marie were appointed as postmaster and postmistress of The Hague, a Dutch city along the North Sea coast. Their job was to make sure mail got delivered, but they also sometimes did the exact opposite and stopped this from happening. When a recipient died or couldn't pay postage, the couple discarded the person's mail into a chest, which amassed around 5,000 letters between 1680 and 1706. The chest was rediscovered in 1926. Since then, only a little over half of them have been opened. But why? Well, back when snail mail was the only way to communicate over long distances and envelopes didn't exist yet, people often protected their privacy by folding their letters in complicated ways to discourage tampering. This method, known as letter locking, was so effective that experts were reluctant to open many of the delicate 300-year-old letters found in the chest, out of a fear that they would damage or destroy them. But researchers were curious enough to know what the unopened mail said to figure out a way to read it without physically unfolding it. Technology has helped scholars read damaged historical documents that contain just a few folds. The letter-locked pieces from the Brienne collection were much more complicated, however, so the team had to advance the existing methods. They came up with an algorithm that distinguishes between paper and ink, enabling them to virtually open a piece of the cleverly folded centuries-old correspondence. The message was sent by a French lawyer named Jacques Senac to his cousin, Pierre Le Pairs in the Netherlands. Dated July 1697, it confirms that a relative died nearly two years earlier. The study's authors believe that the letter was written to settle an inheritance dispute. Their newly developed methods aren't just useful for reading old mail. These tools have the potential to help experts access other fragile historical materials that, until now, they haven't been able to look at. England's Ancient Tunnels There have been at least a dozen ancient tunnels found in Cornwall, England that have so far mystified researchers. These tunnels are unique to Britain, and nobody can pinpoint why exactly the people from the Iron Age built them in the first place. These ancient tunnels date back about 2,400 years, and they aren't the only things that can be found across the Cornwall countryside. Cornwall is also littered with hundreds of ancient stones and man-made features, from ramparts to cliff castles, forts to cattle enclosures. Cornwall has at least 74 structures from the Bronze Age, 80 from the Iron Age, and 55 from the Neolithic Age. There are even a few sites from the Mesolithic Age dating back up to 8,000 years ago, and those are just the ones we have found so far. This place has always been popular. Over the years, about 150 generations of people have worked the land of Cornwall, but they left no written record to explain why they dug dozens of mysterious tunnels deep underground, often located beneath prehistoric settlements. One of the best preserved tunnels in Cornwall is a place called Holligai Fogu. The tunnel itself is about 6 feet in height, nearly 20 feet long, and branches off into other tunnels and chambers. But what's really mysterious is that the tunnel never appeared to be used for anything. It's simply a tunnel going from one place to another without any obvious significance. Some have speculated that the tunnels could have been used by ancient people for hiding. Others claim the tunnels are secret burial chambers. The truth is that nobody has any idea why these tunnels were made, nor why they were made to last for thousands of years. An ancient cold case is solved. Pharaoh Sekinenre Ta II, the Brave, rose to power around 1560 BC, during Egypt's 17th dynasty. According to legend, he exchanged harsh insults with the Hyksos ruler to the north, who had complained about the pharaoh's loud pet hippopotamuses. Apparently too angry to limit his attacks to words, Sekinenre also led numerous military skirmishes against the neighboring Hyksos dynasty. The pharaoh's mummy was discovered in 1881 in a Theban necropolis, situated across the Nile from the ancient city of Luxor. Egyptologist Eugène Grabau unwrapped the mummy and discovered evidence of horrific injuries. Part of Sekinenre's left cheek had been hacked off. His jaw was fractured, his forehead had been cut open with a sharp object, and he had received a crushing blow to the head. Interestingly, his arms were left unscathed.
Researchers initially surmised that the pharaoh was likely ambushed and murdered in his sleep, or while he rode in his chariot. But new evidence that recently came to light suggests that Second Enre died in battle while fighting among his military's front lines. Using highly advanced 360-degree X-ray technology, a team of scientists took a detailed look at the pharaoh's mummy. They discovered additional injuries that had been cosmetically concealed and went unnoticed by past experts. The nature of the wounds challenges the idea that Second Enre was attacked in his sleep. It looks more like he went up against multiple attackers and actively fought for his life. The team theorized that the ruler was abducted by the Hyksos or some other enemy force. He was then bound and then brutally bludgeoned and sliced. Second Enre was around 40 years old when he died. This may sound young, but at the time, people in Egypt rarely lived past age 45. So while the pharaoh met a gruesome and undoubtedly terrifying end, he did not die young. There are still some unanswered questions surrounding the tragedy, but the recent findings mark a tremendous step forward in learning about Second Enre's unfortunate fate. The Guanajuato Mummies In the small city of Guanajuato in central Mexico, archaeologists were shocked to discover hundreds of terrifying mummies with their faces still twisted in terror from when they died. When the science fiction author Ray Bradbury visited Guanajuato back in 1947, he described the mummies he saw there as shocking and horrifying, claiming that he had nightmares after his visit. The story behind the mummies goes back to the 1850s, to a time when the world was stricken by a horrible cholera epidemic. Death rates in Mexico spiked significantly, so much so that they started running out of room in their underground crypts to put the bodies. As a result, they began burying the dead in new crypts above ground, but by 1865, the government had instituted a burial tax. This forced families to pay money to keep their family members buried in the ground. When the families couldn't come up with the taxes, the bodies of their loved ones were excavated and moved into a storage facility. It was when people stopped paying the tax and the bodies started being excavated that the first Guanajuato mummies were found. People were appalled to see that they still looked the same as when they died, twisted in their final moments of horror. In one case, the mummy of a woman was biting into her own arm. It was believed that she had most likely been buried alive when symptoms of her disease made her heart appear to have stopped. There was also a mummy of a woman who died in childbirth and her 24-week-old fetus. It is no surprise that Ray Bradbury was inspired by the gruesome and awful things he witnessed in Guanajuato, enough to write The Next in Line, a story about evil supernatural sources. French Massacre Archaeologists have discovered the mutilated remains of victims of a genocide in northeast France. But this was no recent genocide, it was a massacre that happened 6,000 years ago. Researchers uncovered 10 bodies inside an ancient pit, with the Neolithic people inside clearly having suffered horrible deaths. They showed proof of cuts all across their bodies, including deep lacerations to their heads. The bodies were also lumped together in such a way that suggests they were thrown into the pit haphazardly and without care. According to Philippe Lefranc, one of the archaeologists working on the case, these people were brutally executed, probably by some kind of axe. The remains included the bodies of five adults, an adolescent, and the arms of four other different individuals. These arms were likely war trophies, a fairly common practice at the time. The main theory right now is that a group of warriors from the Parisian Basin attempted to raid the area of Alsace, where the bodies were discovered. The raid, it seems, failed miserably. Ultimately, however, archaeologists say that the Parisians eventually successfully replaced the Alsacians by 4200 BC. The evidence can be seen in the changes in cultural artifacts of the time. Haunted House Fail There's nothing quite as creepy as the stuff you find in an abandoned house. But in Norway, South Carolina, things got extra ghoulish when a group of friends broke into a haunted house and stumbled upon a dead body. The group of friends had been driving around on their ATVs in a remote area when they came across the abandoned home that was rumored to be haunted. Naturally, they had to go in and check it out. At first, everything seemed the normal amount of creepy. The house was full of old junk, it clearly hadn't been lived in for quite some time, and it looked as if the Blair Witch may have been using it as her forest hideout. But as the group of teenagers rummaged through the house, they couldn't help but notice the putrid stench of rot that followed them everywhere. When they went to the back porch, the smell of rot was even more powerful. 
The only thing on the back porch other than a pile of garbage was a deep freezer. When they bravely opened the freezer, they saw a dead man in blue jeans and socks. They immediately ran away and called the authorities. Local deputies never were able to confirm the identity of the body. And two days after its discovery became public knowledge, the abandoned house mysteriously burned down. Ancient Tombs Archaeologists in Turkey have uncovered over 400 creepy tombs decorated with images of grapes and flowers cut into the rock that date back at least 1,800 years. These tombs were crafted in the ancient Greek city of Blondus, right around the 2nd century AD. At the time, the city was actually under Roman occupation. There were still a few Greek colonists in the city, but it was fully under Roman control. The Romans were using these elaborate tombs to bury their family members, and they weren't ordinary burials, but likely involved specialized funeral ceremonies. The Romans created a huge complex with vaulted tombs with the whole crypt sealed behind a massive marble door. The only time anyone was allowed inside was during a burial ceremony. Of course, we don't know exactly what went on in these ceremonies. By the time archaeologists started excavating, the bodies had already been stolen, and everything except the creepy paintings on the walls had been pillaged. What happened to the bodies is anybody's guess, though it's hard to imagine why anyone would steal over 400 remains. Monster Skull In Canada's Yukon Territory, a miner accidentally dug up the fossilized skull of what is being described as an extinct monster. Stuart Schmidt was working near Dawson City when he uncovered the mysterious skull using heavy equipment. He noticed something bizarre sticking out of the gravel. He then climbed out of his machine and pulled the thing out with his hands. It turned out to be the almost perfectly preserved skull of an extinct North American helmeted muskox quite different to the modern tundra muskox, which looks a lot like a bison, in case you were wondering. 11,000 years ago, these animals were hunted by the first Native Americans who lived in Canada, eating and killing so many that they went extinct. But back then, these were huge monsters. They were about twice the size of a modern muskox, like mobile battering rams. These bulky giants weighed almost 1,000 pounds. After the discovery of the creepy skull, it was shipped off to paleontologist Grant Zazula with the territorial government. Scientists are now working to study the remains, hoping to carbon date the skull and do some genetic studies. What would you do if you found the prehistoric skull of a monster while at work? Would you hand it over to scientists or mount it on your wall? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Missing Tongue Archaeologists found the body of a man near the small British village of Stanwyck back in 1991. But it wasn't until just recently that Simon Mays, a human skeletal biologist, took a closer look at the mysterious skeleton. What he discovered is nothing short of horrifying. The skeleton is believed to be of a man who lived 1,500 years before today. He was discovered with a flat rock stuffed into his mouth. Why the rock was there was a mystery, but thanks to new advances in science, Simon and his team of researchers were able to determine that the individual suffered an oral infection at the time of death. The infection had spread to several other parts of his body which probably resulted in his death in the first place. In all likelihood, the infection stemmed from a previous tongue amputation. In other words, his tongue had been cut out of his mouth, his mouth had gotten infected, and that infection spread through his body and killed him. But to understand just how creepy this discovery is, we need to go back to the rock that was found in his mouth. According to live science, there have been multiple burials from between the 3rd and 7th centuries AD in Britain with some eerie similarities. Skeletons have been found with their heads missing, and in place of their head, a rock. Another skeleton with its foot missing had a pot put in place of the foot. The suggestion here is that for whatever bizarre reason, if a person was missing part of their body when they died, whoever buried them would replace it with a rock or a pot to symbolize the missing body part. The Parasite Speaking of missing a tongue, a horrifying parasite was recently discovered at Galveston Island State Park in Texas. The parasite is a type of creepy marine organism called a tongue-eating louse, or a snapper-choking isopod. It detaches the tongue of its victim and then takes its place. The discovery was made by Corey Evans, a fish biologist with Rice University. He had actually been researching skull shapes in different fish when he came across an Atlantic croaker with something bizarre in its mouth. It turned out to be a type of isopod that invades a fish through its gills. This tongue-eating louse worms its way through a fish's gills, latches onto the fish's tongue, 
and then drains it of its blood. It even erodes all the tongue's muscle tissue until there's nothing left except bone. The isopod then attaches itself to the base of the bone where the tongue used to be, thereby becoming the tongue of the fish. It feeds off mucus and tiny bits of whatever the fish eats. Both animals remain alive, the fish doesn't seem to care, and everyone lives a long and happy life, together. Still, this is incredibly creepy. According to Evans, these parasitic isopods are extremely common in the Gulf of Mexico. And even though a fish can live a full life with one of these parasites in its mouth, it sometimes will be infected by two parasites. A second isopod will move in through the gills, trying to get in on the first one's action. The fish will then have so many of these creatures in its mouth that it's unable to swallow its own food and starves in just a couple of weeks. Dakota Ghost Town An archaeological team working with the Nebraska State Historical Society may have just discovered the creepy remains of a cemetery that has been lost since the 19th century. In Dakota County near Omaha Creek, researchers are seeking further evidence of a cemetery once belonging to the town of Omadi. A few of the residents who had lived in the area for quite some time had heard stories about this long-lost Omadi Cemetery, also known as Sand Ridge. But there had never been any photographs, headstones, or any other evidence to confirm the stories. Omadi's founding in 1856 was more than 10 years before Nebraska was even a state. The population here peaked at about 400 citizens. But before long, the waters of the Missouri River started to wash the town away. Combined with the boom in gold mining in nearby Colorado, the population of the town dropped from 400 to only around a dozen. By 1865, shortly after the town was founded, the place was a ghost town. All these years later, scientists finally decided to track down the abandoned cemetery used during the decade that Omadi was a booming village. It's estimated there are at least 30 people buried in the missing cemetery. The scientists had to use ground-penetrating radar over the plot of land where they believe the cemetery once stood. Today, the land is nothing but a field of grass where wildflowers grow. Unfortunately, the archaeologists are still investigating the radar images that they took. And while it does appear that something or someone is hidden underground here, there hasn't been any official announcements yet. Naked Shark In July of 2019, fishermen in the Mediterranean Sea were pulling in their nets when they discovered a rare, unusual, and creepy discovery. Among hundreds of fish, sharks, and a variety of other marine life, there was a blackmouth cat shark. Strangely, it had no skin or skin-related structures. It didn't even have any teeth in its mouth. This is extremely different from something like albinism, which is actually quite common. Scientists have found lots of sharks that have skin and pigmentation abnormalities, but this unusual naked shark is the first discovery of its kind, a living shark with no skin or teeth. And somehow, it was living a perfectly ordinary life before these fishermen rudely pulled it from its home in the sea. The fishermen handed the shark over to scientists who were able to determine it was three years old. It even had a belly full of food before the fishermen killed it. What's really baffling scientists now is how a shark with no teeth or skin managed to live for three years hunting other fish. It had a total of 14 food items in its stomach when researchers did the autopsy, including bony fishes, crustaceans, and even small cephalopods. Perhaps this is the world's only real-life gummy shark. Mummy and Skulls a truly creepy mummy was recently discovered in the ancient city of Luxor in Egypt when its tomb was opened for the first time in 3,500 years. What made this mummy exceptionally creepy? It was surrounded by over 450 statues and funeral masks, as well as skulls and bones, coffin fragments, and more. According to the Egyptian antiquities minister, the tomb was probably made during the 18th dynasty, between the rule of King Amenhotep II and King Tutmose IV. Researchers don't actually know who the creepy mummy was during their life, but they are fairly certain it was someone important. They were definitely important enough that after being mummified and placed in their tomb, skulls of other people were left behind. Perhaps 3,500 years ago, the skulls were those of servants, sacrifices, or something else meant to keep the mummy company while they journeyed to the afterlife. There is still a great deal of the tomb that is unexplored, so we'll have to wait for more information to be revealed. Ancient Leprosy A skull has been found on an uninhabited Caribbean island. This in itself is extraordinarily rare. 
Joined by the fact that the skull has evidence of leprosy, things get even rarer. It's one of the only skulls found on the island that's ever been dated using radiocarbon dating methods. Most other human remains are dated based on whatever artifacts or materials are nearby. These bones come from the late 18th century, from a time when the island of Petit Moustique was used as a leprosarium. Think of a sanitarium, except for people with leprosy. Throughout the 1800s, when people became infected with leprosy, they were sent to isolated islands just like this one to prevent spreading the disease. People of the day just didn't know what else to do with the sick. And believe it or not, this did not only happen in the Caribbean, it also happened on the island of Molokai in Hawaii, with people who had leprosy being segregated from the general population. And although we know that leprosy was prevalent in the Caribbean starting in the middle of the 17th century, this is one of the first times archaeologists have actually found skeletal evidence of the disease. Leprosy causes the disfigurement of a person's hands and feet and face, spreading until a person's limbs are consumed. So it was common back in the day to isolate the sick and hide them, not only because they would become hideous, but because the average person didn't want to become like them, and so everyone with leprosy was shunned. Coffin on the golf course in a pond on a golf course in England, researchers discovered a strange tree trunk coffin. The tree sarcophagus dates back to the Bronze Age and was found to contain human remains and an axe. The amazing discovery was pretty recent, found in 2019. Construction workers were called in to renovate the golf course pond when they came across the coffin by accident. It's been dated to 4,000 years ago and is currently undergoing preservation at the Collection Museum in Lincoln before it's put on display. According to researchers from the University of Sheffield, the sarcophagus would have weighed about half a ton when it was put in the ground. It was made from the hollowed trunk of an oak tree, then buried underneath a massive mound of gravel. Experts believe whoever was buried in the tree was an elite member of the Bronze Age society. This was an immense undertaking by the ancient people of England, and so it was reserved for only the top brass of the community. Mark Caswell, one of the members of the team, says the axe is so well preserved that it looks as though it was made yesterday. But we don't actually know if the axe was used in battle or if it was more of a symbolic burial good. To date, there have only been about 65 of these types of burials found in England. The Oldest Anatomical Specimen the oldest anatomical specimen specifically used for medical research dates back to the 1200s. It might not be the oldest in the world, technically, but it is the oldest known in Europe. This gruesome thing is currently housed in a private collection. It consists of nothing except a human head and shoulders, looking like any Roman emperor's bust sitting on a stand in a palace. Except this one is a real human corpse. Well, the top half. This individual had the top of their skull removed along with their brain and their face gnawed on by a rat. Their face even has traces of insect larvae that were probably laid after they died. As for the arteries, they've been filled with red metal wax to help keep the specimen preserved. We don't know exactly who this person was, but we know that they were turned into a medical specimen sometime around the year 1200. This was during the Dark Ages. Yet despite the barbarism of the Dark Ages, Forensic scientist Philippe Charlier says this specimen is proof that they were still advancing ever so slightly with medicine. Somebody went through all the trouble of filling this person's circulatory system with beeswax, lime, and cinnabar mercury to preserve the body and give the circulatory system a bit of color. His body was dissected and then kept somewhere for continued medical education. He may have been a prisoner, he could have been institutionalized, or he could have simply been a dead man who was unwillingly donated to science. Idol of the Painted Temple The Pachacamac Idol is an oddly disturbing wooden statue of a deity called Ixma. At least, this is who historians think the idol represents. To understand the idol fully, we need to go back to Peru in the 8th century AD. On the northern coast, there was a city called Pachacamac. This city was home to a small chieftainship, with the people here worshipping a god called Ixa Ixma. The city itself spanned over 1,500 acres of land, and for a solid 1,000 years, it was occupied by worshippers of Ixma. The principal place of worship was the Painted Temple, which today is nothing but a sad ruin, barely distinguishable from the desert in which it lies. 
The people who lived here didn't have much to do with the Inca Empire, but after the Inca were destroyed in 1533, the conquistador Francisco Pizarro sent his forces to the central coast, to Pachacamac. Francisco's brother Hernando then walked straight to the front of the painted temple, picked up a great idol representing the local people's god, and smashed it to pieces. The Spanish were absolute in their rule that the indigenous people would no longer worship their own gods. Everyone had to switch to Christianity. The easiest way for the Spanish to make sure this happened was by destroying the temples, smashing all their idols, and erasing their gods from existence. Fast forward to the 1900s, archaeologists found the sculpture of the painted temple in a heap of rubble. Some say it's the same idol that was smashed by Hernando Pizarro almost 600 years ago. Gladiator Holding Cell 172 years ago, a Roman amphitheater was discovered near Kent, England. You probably know by now that Rome invaded Britain around 2,000 years ago, and that it was the furthest reach of their great empire. The Romans built roads, towns, fortifications, and even amphitheaters in what is today England. This particular theater had been used for all kinds of exciting live entertainment, including gladiator battles. Even though the amphitheater was discovered a very long time ago, archaeologists only recently found a rather spooky cell. It was used to hold the people and even sometimes the animals who were about to be executed in front of a live audience. The theater was built in the first century and could hold about 5,000 spectators, and it would have been one of the most popular places in ancient England. The cell that was just discovered had been where the gladiators hung out as they waited to do battle, either willfully or with no other choice. Archaeologists didn't actually find gladiator bones in the cell. Instead, they found the random skeleton of a cat buried at the edge of the cell. They excavated the cat and named it Maxipus. Do you think this mysterious cat belonged to one of the gladiators? Let me know in the comments below. Jesus in a tree There is a very disturbing sculpture of Jesus being absorbed inside a tree. To understand why the sculpture is slowly being eaten by a tree, we need to take a trip back in time to World War II. In the 1940s, the tiny village of Lupkov in Poland was nearly destroyed. Today, there are only a few pieces of the town left, such as an abandoned cemetery and the ruined foundations of a church. Most of the town, even its ruins, have been reclaimed by nature. The sculpture of Jesus is one of them. From what anyone can tell, the statue had once been your standard depiction of Jesus crucified on the cross. But somehow, a tree began to grow around the statue after the war. Since the town has been neglected for over 70 years, the tree has just kept on growing around the statue of the Savior. Now, the only parts of him that are visible are his head and torso. Nearby, even the wooden crosses used to mark the graves have also been consumed by the trees. Headstones are completely covered in moss, the wooden crosses are swallowed by roots, and Jesus is slowly being absorbed into nature by the trunk of a tree. It's a fascinating and eerie example of nature reclaiming its domain. Ancient Mercury Poisoning Some unusual bones have been uncovered in Spain and Portugal. In fact, quite a lot of bones have been found in Spain and Portugal. The bones of 370 people who lived throughout the late Neolithic and Copper Age. The bones date as far back as 5,000 years ago and have shown scientists the first ever evidence of mercury poisoning in humans. We know all about mercury poisoning today, but it took a lot of sickness and a lot of death for us to get a hold on it. Back in 2900 BC, people didn't know anything about mercury poisoning. But what they did know was that if they smashed cinnabar, it transformed into a bright red powder that they could use for painting or to get really high. A team of scientists with the University of North Carolina were interested in seeing how their use of cinnabar was affecting the ancient people in the area. So they looked closely at the bones taken from 370 people excavated from 50 tombs across 23 archaeological sites. They discovered that the people had indeed been victims of mercury poisoning. The poisoning was because of their exposure to cinnabar, a mineral that forms naturally in volcanic areas across the world. In Iberia, cinnabar was used frequently for thousands and thousands of years as a pigment and as a medical substance. People even mined for it all the way back in 5300 BC. 
The issue for these ancient people was that they had no idea the cinnabar had mercury in it and that it was wildly poisonous. They used the pigments to paint their body, sniffed it like a drug, and unwittingly poisoned themselves. Fortunately for them, it probably didn't cause too many issues since the average lifespan at the time was less than 30 years anyway. Celtic Woman Buried in a Tree In yet another unusual tree-related discovery, the ancient body of a woman was found buried inside a hollowed-out tree in Switzerland. According to the researchers, this woman died 2200 years ago. She had been part of a Celtic tribe, perhaps even one of the most prestigious members of the tribe. She was discovered buried in very fine clothes and adorned with jewelry. The interesting thing is that the woman was not the only one of her kind to be buried in a tree coffin. Celts from the Iron Age frequently buried members of their tribes in chunks of trees. This particular burial comes from around the year 200 BC, with the woman being around 40 years old when she died. Her remains were found in the Swiss city of Zurich. Looking around at the modern capital now, it's difficult to imagine that it was once a tiny settlement filled with tribespeople. As for what made this woman so special, it comes down to her fine clothes and jewelry. Judging by the scraps preserved in her grave, archaeologists say she was probably wearing a dress of sheep's wool and a coat of sheepskin when she died. And because she was buried still wearing bronze bracelets, a huge bronze belt, and a necklace of amber and glass, experts say she was definitely a very important person. They just don't know why or how. Peruvian Burial Tombs A team of archaeologists has discovered the remains of 29 people buried at an ancient Peruvian temple. While it's hard to say for certain, most of the dead people appear to have been used as human sacrifices, with at least three of them being children and one of them being a teenager. They were buried over 1,000 years ago in Huaca Santa Rosa de Pucala, located in the coastal region of Lambayeque. The bodies of the children and the teenager belonged to members of the Wadi culture, while the other 25 bodies came from the Moche culture. The Wadi flourished in the central Andes from between the 7th and 13th centuries. The Moche culture flourished right before them from between the 1st and the 6th centuries. The skeletons of the Moche people were found within clay tombs and special burial chambers, along with the sacrificed bodies of llamas and alpacas, and even guinea pigs. But the four bodies of the youngsters were discovered buried in the dirt at the front of the temple. These four had without a doubt been sacrificed. The big mystery here is trying to figure out why. The Moche had inhabited the region first, yet it was the Wadi who built the temple. There seems to have been some kind of transitional period in which the last of the Moche were buried beneath a new temple, while those from the Wadi's own tribe were sacrificed. Bones under the garage In western Slovakia, a man was digging the foundation for his new garage when he made a terrifying discovery. He hadn't made much progress on his project before he uncovered a human skull. Assuming he had just come across the victim of a murder, he phoned the police. But after a bit of an investigation, another skull was discovered. Both of the skulls appeared to be extremely old. Radiocarbon dating placed them around the year 421 AD, or just about 1600 years ago. This was clearly an archaeological matter and not one for the police. Experts surveyed his property and discovered that he had a single grave with the body of two women inside of it. But nobody knows who these women might have been. The 400s and 500s were known as the Migration Period. This was when the Huns, the Lombards, the Goths, the Rugians, the Heruli all started moving into Western Slovakia. People from all over Asia and Europe were spreading throughout Europe with great determination. This resulted in a lot of mixing of the various tribes, leading to a very diverse Europe. And to make matters worse, archaeologists didn't find any grave goods. This means the women had probably had their grave robbed, which was pretty common back then. Plus, one of the skeletons had been smashed as if someone had trampled on it while searching for treasures. Aktun Tunichil Muknal This place is a cave located deep in the jungle of western Belize, also known as the Cave of the Crystal Sepulchre. It was discovered in 1989 that the cave was a sacred Maya site where human sacrifices took place. 
It's filled with dozens of skeletons of sacrificial victims, who range in age from babies who were just a year old to adults as old as 45. Most of the pottery found at the site dates back between 700 and 900 AD, indicating that the human remains are most likely from the same period. The most famous human remains at Aktun Tunichil Muknal belong to the Crystal Maiden, a 17-year-old boy who may have been sacrificed there. His calcified skeleton is famous for its sparkling, crystallized appearance. The bones were originally thought to belong to a female, hence the nickname the Crystal Maiden, but a closer look revealed that the individual was actually a male with a slender build. Nobody knows exactly why the sacrifices at Aktun Tunichil Muknal were performed, just that it was done to appease the Mayan gods. Sadly, we do not really understand the intricacies of their beliefs. Reaching the site is no easy feat. It's located in the remote Tapir Mountain Nature Reserve, requiring visitors to first drive an hour from the town of San Ignacio, then hike for an hour through the jungle in shallow water. The last leg of the journey involves swimming into the cave's entrance, then wading through water for another 0.6 miles. If, however, you're interested in both Mayan culture and their bloody history of sacrifice, perhaps you'd be willing to make the journey. World's Toughest Great White Shark The waters off South Australia are home to an estimated 1,000 great white sharks. While filming near the Neptune Islands earlier this year, cinematographer Dean Sprackman captured shocking footage of an 11-foot-long great white shark, whose body was positively riddled with scars. Sprackman and his team had never seen such an injured shark before, and they have no idea what might have caused him to become that way. They initially speculated that perhaps the gargantuan fish had a run-in with some boat propellers or had ended up in a tuna pen, but the researchers also think that he may have been wounded during a fight with another great white, or a shark of comparable strength and size. The shark was curious and friendly, coming within an arm's length of Sprackman but showing no aggression towards him. Speaking with the sun, Sprackman said that he didn't realize how bad the predator's injuries were until he reviewed his footage afterwards. I think it's safe to say that these battle scars likely mean one of two things. This big guy is one heck of a scrapper, or he's incredibly lucky to be alive after narrowly escaping a fight for his life. Severed Bear Head A few days before Halloween this year, someone spotted a severed bear's head sitting on a tree at Lewis Park in Stockton, California. John Perrin, who made the disturbing discovery, told the local papers that he didn't realize what he was looking at at first. Even after he saw that it was a bear's head, he was still confused, because there aren't many bears in Stockton. Fish and wildlife officials said that they didn't know if the bear was poached or where its head came from, but leaving an animal carcass in a public place is a crime, according to local station KCRA, and the person who staged the sick scene could possibly face charges if the police managed to identify a suspect. Stockton isn't the only place where severed bear parts are turning up. During her morning run one day in October, Black Mountain, North Carolina resident Ashley Mooneyham noticed something unusual along the roadside. She took a closer look and realized that it was a severed bear claw with a bag of salt next to it, presumably to preserve it. This is an ongoing problem in the area as illegal trappers seek to profit from bears' limbs and gallbladders, which are in high demand on the black market for their use in traditional Chinese medicine. At least 34 local bears have lost a limb due to trapping, putting them at a major disadvantage in the wilderness, where their abilities to forage for food and defend themselves are compromised. Scary Lucy The 2000 the 2009 unveiling of a bronze statue of Lucille Ball in her hometown in New York was nothing short of a disaster, and you only need to take one look at it to understand why. Many people compared the frightening sculpture to a zombie from The Walking Dead, while others said that it resembled Steve Buscemi. The shock eventually wore off, and the statue, nicknamed Scary Lucy, was mostly forgotten about. But the internet has a fun way of dredging up the past and bringing widespread attention to matters that weren't as big of a deal the first time around. This is exactly what happened with Scary Lucy in 2015, when someone launched a Facebook campaign to get rid of the homely sculpture. As the word spread, the statue's sculptor, David Poulan, offered to fix or remake Scary Lucy, but the town decided to just have someone else make a new one, and a sculptor named Carolyn Palmer was selected for the job. Palmer's rendition of Lucille Ball was unveiled on August 6, 2016, on what would have been the beloved actress's 105th birthday. Locals approved of the statue, which was much more recognizable and appealing to the eye. They named it Lovely Lucy, in contrast to her demonic-looking predecessor. 
Processor, which sits just 75 yards away, so that guests can experience both the good and the bad versions. David Poulin's sculpting career took a major hit from the Scary Lucy controversy. He would later tell reporters that it was as if people would never drop the subject, with some even making death threats against him. The ordeal caused Poulin to lose his passion for sculpting, and he gave it up for good in 2017. Sewage Tomatoes A lot more raw sewage makes its way into the environment than any of us would like to think. Case in point, residents in Kent, England recently discovered hundreds of so-called poop tomatoes growing in human waste as it pours into the sea. If you haven't already figured it out, the tomatoes grow from seeds that people pass through their excrement and the human waste acts as a fertilizer. Normally, we think of the sight of fresh fruits and vegetables as a positive, pleasant thing. But in this case, it's a bad sign, pointing toward a serious pollution problem along the Kent coast. Even wildlife enthusiasts and seasoned environmental activists had never seen such a thing as poop tomatoes before. Once word got out about the fecal-fed produce, members of parliament faced heavy criticism for supporting measures that allow water companies to dump sewage into rivers, which then carry it to the sea. The poop tomatoes have left local residents horrified and outraged, wondering what other damage raw sewage is doing to the environment. And now, they don't even feel safe letting their children run along the beach, which is understandable given the circumstances. A spokesperson for Britain's Department of Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs denied that the tomatoes had anything to do with human excrement. Instead, they blamed seabirds, claiming that they eat tomato seeds at a nearby landfill and then deposit them along the shore in their droppings. But people aren't buying it, and this is just one of many reasons why it would be a good idea to update Britain's antiquated sewer system, which becomes overwhelmed when it rains and pours waste into the country's waterways. A morbid keepsake. In 2014, French archaeologists discovered five embalmed human hearts in heart-shaped lead urns buried in a cemetery in the northwestern city of Rennes. One of the hearts was found in an airtight lead coffin, along with the remarkably well-preserved remains of an aristocratic widow named Louise de Kengo, who passed away in 1656. An inscription on the vessel containing her husband, Toussaint Perrien's heart, helped researchers identify her. While the heart-in-a-box concept might seem strange to you, it was considered perfectly normal 360 years ago. Dr. Fatima Zora Mokrain, who led an in-depth study of the five hearts, explained that it was common during the time, and perhaps even seen as romantic, for a person to be buried with their spouse's heart. Using MRI and CT technology, Mokrain and her colleagues examined the other four hearts, which they also found in the graves of elite families. They were so well preserved, the team detected signs of heart problems, plaque and arteriosclerosis, although they didn't say whether these conditions contributed to the individual's death. Fatbergs Fatbergs are huge masses of fats and other solid waste that accumulate in sewers, usually in large cities like London and New York. In the words of Thames Water employee Alex Saunders, who spoke with National News, a fatberg smells like rotting meat mixed with the odor of a smelly toilet. In 2019, workers discovered a 210-foot-long fatberg beneath the small seaside town of Sidmouth in England. They were curious about how such a large mass could form among the small population of just 13,000 residents. A team of scientists performed an autopsy on the fatberg. Once they got past the putrid stench, they dissected the foul wad of waste. Much to their surprise, it was made of much safer materials than the team had imagined. In a statement, study leader John Love explained that the Sidmouth Fatberg was nothing more than a huge wad of fat with wet wipes, sanitary towels, and other household products that should really go in the garbage and not down the drain. By discarding trash properly, these formations can be avoided. In September 2017, workers spent three weeks unclogging a Whitechapel sewer of the largest known fatberg in British history. Sharpened Sweets You've probably seen public service announcements warning parents to check their kids' Halloween candy to make sure that someone's marijuana edibles or any other drug didn't end up in their basket. While this isn't common, it's always better to be safe than sorry. And as residents in the city of Fostoria, Ohio recently learned, some people really do tamper with candy and and then hand them out to children. The day after Halloween, news outlets reported that an observant trick-or-treater found a sewing needle planted inside a Kit Kat bar they'd collected the previous night. Police thankfully only know of two pieces of candy being dangerously modified like this, but it doesn't make it any less scary to know that someone out there wanted to hurt kids. 
to ease parents' fears, residents were given the opportunity to have their Halloween candy x-rayed at the local hospital to check for any foreign parts. An equally, if not more disturbing case of candy tampering happened in Florida this year, when an 8-year-old girl bit into a 100 grand mini chocolate bar and cut her mouth on something sharp. Her mother examined the sweet and found an X-Acto blade. However, in many cases this is just an urban legend. A teenage boy from upstate New York struck fear into the community when he claimed to bite into a Twix bar with a sewing needle, but he later admitted to making the story up to boost his TikTok ratings. The Edinburgh Vaults The Edinburgh Vaults are a series of chambers located in a series of arches inside Southbridge in Edinburgh, Scotland, dating back to 1788. For a short time, the vaults were used as they were intended, as storage spaces and workshops for businesses operating out of South Bridge. These spaces soon began to leak and flood due to the bridge never being waterproofed. Courtesy of rushed, flawed construction and budgetary constraints, businesses began abandoning the vaults in 1795. Poor people and sketchy business operators took over the vaults, using them as living spaces and running pubs and brothels out of them. But this was no place to raise a family or even to carry out one's dirty deeds. Crime proliferated, and these damp, crowded spaces, which often housed families of 10 or more to a single room, continued to rapidly deteriorate. They not only steadily leaked, but were unsanitary and unventilated, with little light, air, or heat. The vaults were permanently abandoned within 30 years of the South Bridge's completion. To deter future squatters from taking up residence, they were filled in with rubble and eventually forgotten about. Nori Rowan, a Scottish former rugby player, rediscovered the vaults in the 1980s. He was exploring a tunnel connected to them during a quest to help another rugby player and Romanian defector, Christian Raducanu, escape the Romanian secret police and obtain political asylum just before the Romanian Revolution of 1989. Rowan and his son excavated the vaults during the 1990s, removing hundreds of tons of rubble by hand. While little official documentation exists to describe the day-to-day -day lives of the tenement residents, artifacts like old toys, medicine bottles, horseshoes, clay pipes, buttons, diningware, and other household items help to tell their story. You can tour them today, and while it's disturbing enough to imagine someone living in such dismal conditions, these chambers are considered one of Britain's most haunted places. For especially brave or crazy souls, ghost tours are available, and the vaults are open to the public overnight. Would you spend the night in these haunted vaults? Let me know in the comments below! Thanks for watching! What's the scariest thing you've ever discovered? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!